Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron from the First Presbyterian Church of Elmwood Park. Uh, today is what uh, we Protestants call Reformation Sunday, where we celebrate some things about our uh, Protestant heritage uh, from the 16th century. And um, uh, we're going to look carefully at a text from John chapter 8 uh, in that light. And uh, here it is, John 8, 31 to 36. To those Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we'll be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the reading of the word, my friends. Amen. All right. If you had 20 seconds to explain the gospel to someone, would you start with the fact that we're all sinners? You could. That is one approach. You could say, Look, we're all sinners, we're all trapped in sin, and we need a savior. Fortunately, we have one, Jesus. You should accept that good news that you are saved. I call that telling the bad news first, so that you can tell the good news afterwards. I once heard a really extreme form of this. There was some guy with a bullhorn, probably in California because the weather was good, and people would come up and he'd say, uh, you ever stolen anything? And they'd say, yeah, I stole a pack of gum when I was a kid. And say you um, you ever been driving and called somebody an idiot? And say oh, they'd say yeah for sure all the time. And he'd say well you know the Bible says if you call somebody a fool, that's like murdering them. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said you ever looked at somebody of the opposite sex with uh, <clears throat> lust? <laughs> and uh, he's it's a uh, yeah. And, well, the Bible says that's like committing adultery with them. So let's run this down. You're a thief, you're a murderer, and you're an adulterer. Uh, you deserve to go to hell, and you better come to Jesus right away to get out of it. Now, I guess in some technical sense, everything this guy with the bullhorn said is true. But is it, is it attractive? Does it present the good news as good? I wonder how many people that he talked to said in the hills, wow, this guy is wonderful to be around. I really want to go to his church. Not many, I suspect. Now, there's an alternate approach. I generally like it better. I call it telling the good news first. Look, God loves you so much that God became a human being in Jesus of Nazareth. This is an amazing expression of God's power, grace, and love. Wouldn't you like to enter into that mystery? That seems better to me. Now there's an extreme form of this though, that goes more into a really hardcore, I'm okay, you're okay. Look, Jesus loves you and me just the way we are. Sure, we can, so sure, we can be Christians, right? It's easy, uh, neither of us have to change anything about ourselves or how we live our life. Uh, just put on this uh, Christian lapel pin or wear a cross necklace, uh, but or don't do anything at all. It's, it's, it's all good. You know what? Both those approaches have some merit, but I don't like either method in its extreme. Um, we need to adapt to the situation we find ourselves in and the people we're talking to. In other words, sometimes people need to be confronted with the bad news first on the way to the good news, but it shouldn't be a mind game or an attack. Now, other people, most people, in my opinion, need to hear the good news first. They need to trust Jesus before they can uh, process the bad news, but you can't tell them they don't need to do anything or that there'll be no difference once they become a Christian. It seems to me that in John 8, Jesus is using the good news first method. He's been talking to this group of people for all of 20 verses, and he hasn't mentioned the bad news part at all. Verse 30 says that as he was saying these things, many of the people he was talking to came to believe in him or to have faith in him. And so he brought them in with the good news first, but he doesn't give them a lot of time before the other shoe drops. 
In verse 31, he turns to those very same people, the ones who believe, and he says this, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, to me, that sounds pretty good. But to them, in their culture and time, they took great offense because he was referencing slavery, and they got their slaves were a thing they knew about because there were a lot of them around. So they got really huffy. Hey, we aren't slaves. We've never been slaves. So how can you say that we shall be set free? I was hanging around with some other pastors this week. At one point, we were mentioning how excited we get when visitors come to our church. We bend over backwards to try and make a positive impression. So we want them, we, we do so want them to come back every week. So we definitely don't want to do anything to put them off. But Jesus has had this group of followers for maybe a minute. <laughs> He's already challenging them. Poke them right dead center in the middle of their pride. We are children of Abraham, they retort. Jesus basically says, yeah, so? Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I want you to notice what Jesus is doing. He is challenging them. I also want you to notice what he is not doing. He is not condemning them. You and I might be quick to condemn people for their sins, for their crimes. Jesus does not do that. He may point out our sins, but he does not condemn. John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. No, Jesus does not condemn, but he does point out an important fact. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin, and a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. Sin is akin to crime, I suppose, but that is not what Jesus says here. He names sin as bondage. D.A. Carson puts it beautifully. For Jesus, then, the ultimate bondage is not enslavement to a political or economic system, but vicious slavery to moral failure, to rebellion against the God who made us. The despotic master is not any other human being, but our own shameful self-centeredness and evil enslaving devotion to created things at the expense of the Creator. The Gospel, as the Apostle John approaches it, is a Gospel of liberation. The good news is equated with freedom. Grace brings the ability to act rightly and love deeply. And that, my friends, is the truth, the good news. I don't care whether you get there starting with the bad news or starting with the good news, as long as you get there. Christ brings freedom to our bondage to sin. Now we've gotten to my favorite part of this passage. If you hold to Jesus' teaching, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This verse is why this passage is perfect for Reformation Sunday. We Protestants have long asserted both the demands and the benefits of truth. There was a pretty good 2003 film about that most famous Protestant, Martin Luther. In it, a friend of his, a poor widow in the town, has just purchased what is called an indulgence for sin. These indulgences were sold by the Roman Catholic Church of the 1500s as a kind of a sin insurance. Supposedly, as the sales pitch went, some sin of yours or someone else's would be overlooked by God if you paid money for this indulgence, a little piece of paper. Some people bought them for themselves, some for their dead relatives. It's been a long time since I saw the movie, but I think this woman had purchased it for her young daughter, just in case the daughter should sin later on. She proudly shows it to young Luther, still a Catholic priest at that time in the film. She is so happy that it makes him smile for a moment, but then he frowns a bit. 
and he takes a coin out of his pocket and refunds what she paid for the indulgence. She is a little confused and worried, and you might ask the question, if she was happy, why interfere? Okay, it might be a delusion, or a con job even, but it was a delusion that made her happy. Luther, the soon-to-be Protestant crusader, cannot permit delusions about the gospel because they will get in the way of you realizing the good news. For it is the truth that will set you free. Anything that obscures the truth is just an impediment. And yet, some churches, even some Protestant churches, do not tell the truth. When they proclaim the gospel, they proclaim a gospel of condemnation to manipulate people into feeling guilty and desperate so that they will do anything to feel better. Other churches go in the opposite direction. You're fine just the way you are. God loves you. And if God loves you, God will fill your bank account. If you are successful in this world, that must mean you're on the right track. But we, we name the truth. Sin is bondage. Human beings are enslaved to it, and the only way to get free is through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Son of the Lord, the Son of God, has taken notice of us and gives us a certificate of manumission, proof of our freedom. We are grateful when we use our freedom to be about the Lord's work in this world. And having been recognized and commended by the Son, we are offered the chance to become Christ's brothers and sisters. Galatians 3, 26 to 28. So in Jesus Christ, you are all sons and daughters of God, heirs and inheritors through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you were all one in Christ Jesus. Here's a parallel passage from John 15, 14 to 17. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because slaves do not know their master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. And this is my command to love one another. Listen, my friends, in Christ there is no condemnation. There's no threat. There's no falsehood. No delusion, delusion or placebo is necessary. Also, no donation is required. The good news is free, and it will set you free. If you choose to, you can live into this beautiful reality that I'm describing. You can live into your freedom. I hope that you will all do that. I'm sure trying. <laughs> God bless. Amen.